One of the most important things to consider when flying an aircraft is the weight and balance. Every aircraft has limitations. If the airplane's too heavy, it'll have trouble getting off the ground on a takeoff. It'll have trouble stopping when it goes to land, and the wings might not be able to create enough lift in order to be able to fly. Now, we'll be discussing weight and how it affects performance in a future episode. But in addition to that, the aircraft must be balanced properly so you can actually control it. And if it's not, there are a few problems you could run into. Before we discuss those, I want to explain what it means to have a balanced airplane. When discussing this topic, most instructors use the illustration of a seesaw or a teeter-totter or whatever you call it. What happens when there's more weight on one side of the seesaw? The seesaw is no longer balanced. But as you know, there can also be the same exact amount of weight on both sides, and if the weight gets closer to the fulcrum on one of those sides, it will still be out of balance. Airplanes work the same way, but instead of a fulcrum like the one we see on a seesaw, all the weight of an airplane balances on what we call the center of lift. When the wing of an airplane creates lift, all the lifting forces that the wing produces don't all go in exactly the same direction. But if you were to average out those forces, you could see that most of the lift is generally concentrated in one direction. And this is what we call the airplane's center of lift. And you might also hear some instructors refer to this as the center of pressure. But no matter what you call it, this is basically the fulcrum on an airplane, and the weight of an aircraft is kind of like a cradle that is suspended from this point. Now, I do want to point out that the center of lift does move when you change your airplane's angle of attack. As a general rule, if you increase the angle of attack on an airplane, the center of lift moves forward. And this is important to remember because your airplane may have been balanced enough to control it at a low angle of attack, but if you're a little too tail heavy, you can see that the airplane might become impossible to control if you increase the angle of attack too much in this situation. We'll go into a little bit more detail on this in just a minute. Next, we have the center of gravity. And the easiest way to explain this is to look back at our seesaw. The center of gravity is basically the point on our seesaw where we need to put our fulcrum if we want the weight on our seesaw to be balanced. It's basically the average place on something where the weight is concentrated. But oddly enough, we don't put the center of gravity right on our fulcrum or center of lift on an airplane. And here's why. As you know, the engine in the nose of your airplane is super heavy and it would be almost impossible to balance that out with something else in the tail without adding too much weight to the airplane. Instead, what airplane manufacturers do is they essentially put an upside down wing back here at the back of the airplane. And what that does is it gives us a downward force to balance out our heavy engine without adding a bunch of extra weight. And now that you know that, you can kind of start seeing what needs to happen in order for our airplane to balance out in flight. First, the center of gravity needs to be in front of the center of lift. This allows the elevator or stabilator to do its job and to create a downward force that will balance out our center of lift with our center of gravity. But if you remember from our lesson on how an airplane creates lift, this means that in order for our airplane to be balanced, we need to have some air moving over the tail in order to balance out the aircraft. This is why the nose of the airplane feels so heavy when you're first trying to take off and you haven't built up enough airspeed. Then, once you build up enough airspeed, the airplane wants to pitch up and climb out on its own because of all that excessive tail down force created by the relative wind. And once you start practicing those soft field takeoffs, you're gonna really struggle keeping the airplane from climbing out of ground effect because of that. And that's the whole point of elevator trim. It basically allows you to position your elevator or stabilator so it will give you a certain amount of tail down force. And this allows you to balance out the airplane in flight. That's why you need to retrim the aircraft anytime you change your airspeed. Now, let's talk about what would happen if you had your center of gravity too far forward. And this would mean that you have too much weight in the nose of the aircraft. Well, the first thing you'll notice is the obvious. You're going to have a hard time raising the nose of the airplane. You may not have enough tail down force to overcome the weight you have in the nose. Then, if you ever do get the airplane up in the air, it's going to take a lot more extra downforce on the tail to keep the nose up so you can fly straight and level. In extreme nose heavy situations, you could even potentially have full nose up trim and still need to pull back on the yoke to maintain level flight. I don't even want to think about a situation where I would need to climb because there's something in front of me and I can't overcome the weight of the nose because I put too much weight up there in the front.
Another problem with this is that when you do this, you're pushing the tail down, which also increases your angle of attack. And this does a couple things. First, you can't fly quite as fast because you're at a high angle of attack and there's more drag on the airplane. But you also increase your airplane stall speed when you do this because you're closer to your critical angle of attack. So this can be a problem as well. But what happens when you have too much weight in the back of the airplane or the center of gravity is too far aft? Well, think about what the tail's doing. That's the key here. Remember, the tail is balancing out the weight of our airplane so we can control it. With that in mind, if your tail is heavy, you don't need as much tail down force to keep the nose up. And there's even less drag on the airplane now because we're flying at a lower angle of attack. And that means we can fly faster airspeeds. At first glance, this might seem ideal, but remember what I mentioned earlier. The tail is balancing out our aircraft on the center of lift. If the tail is too heavy and the center of gravity is farther back, the airplane becomes less stable. This gets even worse at slower airspeeds because the center of gravity moves back even more as you increase the angle of attack to maintain altitude. In addition to that, the center of lift also moves forward as we mentioned earlier. And it doesn't take much for the airplane to get out of balance. And when that happens, it becomes completely uncontrollable. In tail heavy situations, if you were to get yourself into a stall or a spin, you're pretty much toast. I hope you enjoyed your life. At least you got to fly a few times before you died. Anyways, you're likely most not gonna be able to recover the aircraft. And that's the whole reason why we calculate the weight and balance of our airplane. For each aircraft, the manufacturer has already done all the hard math for you. They give you a limitation for how nose heavy the airplane can be. And they also give you a limit for how tail heavy the airplane can be. And as long as you stay within those boundaries, they're pretty much guaranteeing that you're gonna be able to control the airplane. In just a minute, I'm going to explain how to know whether or not you're in those limits. But first, I want to point out that these limits can also depend on what you're using the airplane for. Notice on this chart we have two categories, normal and utility. Now don't worry, I'm going to explain how to use this spaghetti chart in just a minute, and it's really simple. But for now, I just want you to see that the airplane manufacturers have decided that if you're going to be doing certain things like spins or other types of approved aerobatics, the forward and aft limits you have to work with are smaller in this utility category, which allows you to do a few more things with the airplane. In addition to the smaller CG limits, you also have to be a lighter weight. I guess they think you might break the wings off or something. Airplanes don't fly too good in helicopter mode. Okay, so now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how we know that our airplane is within its center of gravity limits. To make this easier to explain, let's go back to our seesaw. Now, we know our fulcrum is our center of lift, and we kind of have an idea of what the center of gravity is. But now, we need a way to figure out where the average weight is on our seesaw to determine where our center of gravity is. And the first step in doing that is to take a measurement from a spot somewhere on the seesaw. To make things simple, for this example, we'll take our measurements from the left side of the seesaw. Now, the name of this spot where we start our measurements is called our reference datum. And from here, we simply measure how far something is away from that spot. Here in the good old US of A, we take measurements in inches. But in Europe or other countries, you might take these measurements in millimeters. And if you're lucky enough to be from Canada, you might take these measurements in moose tracks. I'm really not sure. Someone must be getting mad right now because I smell maple syrup. Now that you're mad at me, I guess now's probably not a good time to ask you to buy my gear. But I promise it'll cheer you up, and if you do, there's a link in the description if that's something you want to check out after you finish this lesson. Anyway, let's put a few weights on our seesaw and talk about them. Let's say this one right here is a 10 pound weight, and it's exactly 16 inches away from our reference datum. This distance that our weight is from the datum is called the arm. And if you're using millimeters to make this measurement, your arm would be 406.4 millimeters. And this is really important to us because this helps us determine how much torque this 10 pounds is actually putting on our seesaw. In aviation, we like to call this measurement of torque the moment. Now, I would like to introduce you to a formula that we use to calculate the moment. WHAM! This stands for weight times arm equals moment. So, if you want to calculate how much force or torque this weight was putting on our seesaw, you simply multiply our weight of 10 pounds times our arm of 16 inches to get the torque or moment of 160 inch pounds. Now, in this example, the moment we calculated is given in relationship to the reference datum, 
but if we wanted, we could also determine our moment in relationship to the fulcrum as well. And to do that, all we need to do is find this distance here between our fulcrum and our weight. And as you know, 16 minus 9 is 7. So our arm in this example is 7 inches. Now, we can pull out that WAM formula to see that if we were to multiply the weight of 10 pounds times our arm of 7 inches, the weight is putting 70 inch-pounds of force on our fulcrum. Typically, we don't do calculations this way because we like to make things easy on ourselves, but I think it's important to mention this so you can fully understand the principle. But when it comes to calculating weight and balance, the main thing we care about is finding where the average force is being applied. And this is what we call our center of gravity. To do this, we need to look at everything together on our seesaw, including the seesaw itself. Because a seesaw has weight as well, and if there were no weights on the seesaw and the fulcrum was off-centered, the seesaw would no longer be balanced even if it was by itself. Okay, so let's take a look at everything we have here. First, we've got weight A, which weighs 10 pounds with an arm of 3 inches, because it's 3 inches from the reference datum. 10 times 3 equals 30, so this one's moment is 30 inch-pounds from the datum. Then we have weight B, which also weighs 10 pounds at 8 inches from the datum. So this guy's moment is 80 inch-pounds. Then we have weight C, which we've already said weighs 10 pounds with an arm of 16 inches. So it's creating 160 inch-pounds of force. Now, the one everyone forgets to do is the seesaw. Let's say that the seesaw weighs 10 pounds. Where is the seesaw's arm? Notice that my weights are centered on these arm locations, so my arm is the center of whatever the item is that I'm weighing. Unless, of course, they tell you the center of gravity is somewhere else. And if they did, that would be the arm of the seesaw. But in this case, the center of gravity on this seesaw is 9 inches. So my arm is going to be 9 inches here. And now that we know that, we can find our moment by multiplying 10 times 9. So the seesaw's moment is 90 inch-pounds. Okay, now that we know that, we can look at all this stuff together to find out where our center of gravity is. First, let's add up the total weight. Let's see. 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 40. So we have 40 pounds of total weight. Now we need to find our total moment. And by the way, the total arm is completely useless. Nobody uses that. Anyway, let's add 30 plus 80 plus 160 plus 90 to get our total moment of 360 inch-pounds. Now, to figure out where our center of gravity is, all you need to do is remember this simple formula, mom's overweight. And I'm sorry I have to tell you that about your mom, but this is really going to help you remember how to calculate your center of gravity. Plus, you're probably going to need to be doing weight and balance calculations anyways if she's going to be flying with you. So, now that we know that, we'll take our moment of 360 inch-pounds and divide that by our total weight of 40 pounds. And by George, the center of gravity is right there at our arm of 9 inches. No wonder this teeter-totter is balancing itself out. Now, here's where things start getting a little weird. This reference datum where we take our measurements from can literally be anywhere on the seesaw. It could be over here on the right side of the board or we could put it right on the fulcrum like this. And we could count into the negatives this direction and the numbers on the right could be completely normal. But don't worry, this is pretty simple to figure out. Let's just take a look at everything together just like we did a minute ago. Let's see, we've got 10 pounds at an arm of negative 4 this time. To find our moment, we simply multiply 10 times negative 4 to get negative 40. And if you were that guy that slept through high school math class, I'll give you a quick reminder. A negative times a positive equals a negative, and a negative times a negative equals a positive. So this moment is going to be a negative number if the arm is a negative. Anyway, we've got another 10 pounds at negative 1 this time, so our moment on this one is negative 10. Then we have a 10 pound weight over here at an arm of 70 inches, so it looks like our moment here is 70 inch pounds. And don't forget our seesaw, which is 10 pounds, and it looks like the center is 0, so this moment will actually be 0 in this example, because 10 times 0 equals 0. Okay, so let's take a look at all these weights and moments together like we did before. Once again, we have a total weight of 40 pounds, but if we add minus 40 plus minus 10, plus 70, plus 0, we get a total of 20 inch-pounds. And remember how your mom's overweight? Let's use that to figure out where our center of gravity is. And to do that, we'll take 20 inch-pounds divided by 40, so our center of gravity is at 0.5 inches from the datum. Wait a second, it's not at 0? That means this thing isn't balanced. There we go, that's better. Okay, now we've got a problem. What do we need to do to balance this thing out? 
first, we need to figure out how far the center of gravity needs to move in order to balance this thing out. Well, it looks like it needs to move 0.5 inches to the left, and if our CG was negative 0.5, then it would need to move 0.5 inches to the right. Okay, so now we know how much we need to move our center of gravity to get this thing balanced out. But we only have these three weights to work with, or the teeter-totter itself, but let's not make things hard on ourselves by moving that around. Here's a look at the formula you'll be using anytime you need to shift weight in order to get your center of gravity to balance out. I recommend taking a snapshot of this or writing it down so you have it for the written exam. You may also want to save this for when you get your license in case you need to move your mom around so you can balance out the plane for that too. Anyway, when you look at this formula, you can see that we can solve any weight shift problems as long as we have three of the four things you see here. Here, we have our weights to be shifted. We know we've got some 10 pound weights we can shift, so let's see what we need to do if we just move one of those. Then we have our total weight, which we said was 40 pounds. This CG change is how much we need to move our CG over. We said that was negative 0.5, so let's write that down here. The only thing we don't know is how much we need to move that 10 pound weight, so let's make this x. So now, to figure out this problem, we need to solve this little equation. 10 divided by 40 equals negative 0.5 divided by x. If you remember from your middle school algebra days, all we need to do here is cross multiply. So x times 10 equals 10x, and 40 times negative 0.5 equals negative 20. Now, we divide 10x by 10 and negative 20 by 10 as well. When we do that, we can see that x equals negative 2. That means we need to move one of these 10 pound weights left towards our negative side 2 inches. Now, if you're scratching your head right now because you need a refresher on basic algebra skills, welcome to the 21st century. All you need to do is Google search equation solver with steps or algebra solver with steps and there are literally websites out there that will solve the problem for you and walk you through the steps they took to solve it. I literally typed equation solver with steps into Google here and this very first one is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. I know, right? This would have made my homework so much easier when I was a kid. Anyway, so now we simply move over one of these 10 pound weights 2 inches and now we see our seesaw is once again balanced. Let's do one more of these really quick so you can see how they may ask you one of these questions on the test. Let's say they give us this picture here and they tell us they want us to balance this thing out. Before we can do anything else, we need to figure out exactly where the center of gravity is so we can figure out what we need to do. To make things easy on ourselves, let's write out everything we see here just like we did in the other examples. First, we have thing A here, which is 500 pounds. And look at that. Those jerks didn't tell us where the reference datum is. Well, they did. They just didn't label it here. If you notice, all these measurements were made from the fulcrum, so that's our datum in this example. And as you can see, it's pretty much identical to our last seesaw example. That means if this guy is to the left of the datum, his arm is going to be negative 15 inches. And if we multiply 500 times negative 15, we get a moment of negative 7,500 inch pounds. Then we have thing B here, which is 250 pounds. And his arm is 20 inches, which makes his moment 5,000 inch pounds. Then last but not least, we have our super heavy 200 pound plank. And when you first glance at this, it might seem a little confusing, but it's actually super simple. Look where the plank's center of gravity is. It's 15 inches to the right of the fulcrum, so its arm is 15 inches. That's how simple this is. Now we can just multiply the plank's weight of 200 times 15 inches to get a moment of 3,000 inch pounds. All right, let's add up all these weights to get a total weight of 950 pounds. Then we'll add up all these moments to get a total of 500 inch pounds. And I don't have to remind you that mom's overweight to find out where our center of gravity is. So 500 inch pounds divided by 950 pounds gives us a center of gravity of 0.5263579 inches. Wow, this does seem like an FAA question, doesn't it? They could have easily put the CG right at 0.5 inches, but they didn't. And because the CG is over here slightly to the right of the fulcrum, as you know, the seesaw would fall over this way, but these magical FAA figures don't always make a lot of sense, so we have to back up our common sense with our math skills. Anyway, we know our CG needs to move left 0.53 inches to get this thing to balance out. So now we need to decide what we want to move to get this thing to balance out. Now, they're almost never going to give you an option of moving the plank over, because that would be too easy. You'll likely need to move the big weight over or this little one. But since our CG is so close to being balanced, let's just move this small one. 
And to do that, let's pull out our weight shift formula and see how much we need to move it. Okay, so the weight to be shifted is going to be our 250 pound weight. So let's just put this in here. Then we said our total weight is 950 pounds. Then we know we need to move our CG over to the left 0.53 inches, so that will be negative 0.53. And this distance that the 250 pound weight needs to move is what we're trying to figure out. So let's call this x. Once again, we'll cross multiply these and that gives me 250x equals negative 503.5. Then we'll divide both sides by 250 and that makes x negative 2.014. So if we move the 250 pound weight left 2.014 or negative 2.014 inches, that means this thing's going to be balanced out. That wasn't too hard, was it? Except for finding 0.014 inches on this plank. Okay, so now let's take a look at one of these on a real airplane. And the first thing you're going to notice is probably some really wonky looking arms and moments. If you take a look at the arms, or what I like to call load stations, on this Cessna 172 Sierra, you'll notice that the datum here starts at the firewall. Now, for the past few minutes, we've been measuring everything off the fulcrum, and if you remember from earlier, we said that our center of lift actually changes with our angle of attack. So this isn't really the best place to put our datum. Most manufacturers pick something that should never move, so the firewall is a very common place for them to put the datum line. Then, everything in front of our datum will once again be negative, and everything behind it will be positive. Don't worry, these problems are going to be just as easy to solve as the seesaw problems. And you might actually find them a little bit easier because the POH gives you a lot of tools to help with the math. Okay, so now you can look down here and see that they built a similar table to the one we've been using with the seesaw. First, you can see that they've given us a basic empty weight of the airplane. And they've even calculated the moment for us. Wait a minute! How is 1,642 pounds only creating 62.6 inch-pounds of force? That doesn't make any sense at all. This is something you kind of have to watch out for. Notice right here, it says this is our moment in inch pounds divided by a thousand. So this number is actually 62,600 inch pounds. Okay, that makes way more sense. Notice on this chart here, they don't give us the arm. If we want to know that, a lot of times they'll have something like this that shows the arm location for each spot in the airplane you could actually put something. As you can see, the center of gravity for the usable fuel is 48 inches after the datum. So if we want to figure out that moment, we first need to know the weight of our fuel. We typically figure that aviation fuel weighs about 6 pounds per gallon. So if there's 30 gallons in the tank, that would mean we have 180 pounds of fuel. And if we multiply that times our load station of 48 inches, we'd get a moment of 8,640 inch pounds. And we'll follow their lead by turning this into an 8.6. Okay, so now let's say you weigh 180 pounds and you wanted to take your overweight mom with you and she weighed 300 pounds. 180 plus 300 equals 480. So we've got 480 pounds at load station 37. Notice here they actually give you a range because the seats move back and forth. So if you're super tall and you need to sit all the way back and your mom needs to sit all the way back because her belly's too big, you might want to use load station 46. So 480 times 46 equals 22,080 inch-pounds. So let's throw 22.1 in here. Okay, so let's add one more thing in here really quick. Maybe you wanted to bring 50 pounds worth of luggage with you on this little adventure with your mom. If you were going to put it in this baggage area back here, you could just use this load station and do the math the same way we've been doing, or you could use this handy little tool that some POHs have in them. This little spaghetti chart saves you the agony of having to use your basic math skills. And as you can see, it has most of the places you might want to put something. But for this example, we said that we're bringing 50 pounds of luggage, and we're going to put it in baggage area 1. So we'll find our baggage area 1 line and move up the line until we hit 50 pounds. Then we'll move down the chart to see that our moment for this bag is going to be 5, or actually 5 times 1,000. So let's put a 5 in here. Now we can see if we're going to be in limits, so we know for sure that we're going to be able to control our airplane on this little trip. So just like before, let's add up all our weights first. 1,642 plus 180 plus 480 plus 50. I'm getting 2,352 pounds. Then we'll add up all our moments. We've got 62.6 plus 8.6 plus 22.1 plus 5. And I'm getting 98.3 on this one. But remember, technically this is 98,300 inch-pounds. Now, let's pull out this complicated looking spaghetti chart. 
And what we're looking at here is a range where our center of gravity can be. And as long as it falls within this chart, we're going to be able to control the aircraft. Okay, so we weighed 2,352 pounds. So let's draw a line straight over from here. And notice, we also have a maximum weight limit of 2,550 pounds. We don't want to overload our airplane. But we're going to discuss that more in the performance episode. Then, let's find our moment of 98.3 and draw a line up from here. And as you can see, we do fall inside of our center of gravity envelope for the normal category. So we are going to be able to take mom out today, but we're quite a ways from the utility category, so spins might not be a good choice today. Let's do another one of these really quick, because a lot of POHs have a chart that shows you where the airplane center of gravity is instead of the moment chart. This POH has both, and that's kind of nice because you can choose whatever's easiest for you. And if you need to shift the weight around, this one's probably going to be a little bit easier to deal with. Let's say our plane weighs the same, and our center of gravity is 38 inches after the datum. And once again, that would make our moment 62,600 inch-pounds. Once again, we have 30 pounds of fuel, and that means we have 180 pounds of fuel 48 inches after the datum. And that gives us a moment of 8,640. This time, you're sitting up front by yourself, so we'll put 180 pounds 46 inches after the datum. And that gives us a moment of 8,280. Now, Mama's sitting back here because her belly's just too big. She don't fit too good up front. She's been nervous about something lately, and she's been eating a lot. And because of that, now she weighs 400 pounds, and it looks like the rear passenger seat is going to be 73 inches after the datum. So that gives us a moment of 29,200 inch pounds. And by the way, she still wants to bring her 50 pound bag with her. So let's put that at low station 95 again. So that'll be another 5,000 inch pounds. Okay, so now our total weight is 2,452 pounds. And if we add up our total moment, that gives us a total moment of 113,720 inch-pounds. Now, let's find our center of gravity by acknowledging that mom is overweight. So, 113,720 inch-pounds divided by 2,452 pounds equals 46.4 inches after the datum. So, are we going to be able to fly with mama? Oddly enough, we are. I mean, barely, but mama's going to be fine back there. Now right now you're probably noticing that these Cessna 172s are really easy to keep balanced. And that's one of the reasons why people love them so much. But if you were to fly like an old Bonanza D35, you know the old V-tailed doctor killers? Those are really easy to get the center of gravity too far aft. And with that in mind, it's also not impossible to do it on a 172 either. I'll show you an example here in just a minute. And when we look at that, I'll show you how to shift the weight a little bit if you did happen to be out of limits. But notice how close we are to the line right now. In these situations, it's really important that you're using accurate data. And I want to talk about that for just a minute. By now, you've probably heard of the acronym AERO, which is an easy way to remember the documents that you're required to have on board the aircraft anytime you go fly. The W in this acronym stands for weight and balance. And while there's nothing specific that says you need to do the weight and balance every time you go fly, I want to point out something in FAR 91.9. Except as provided in paragraph D of this section, no person may operate a civil aircraft without complying with the operating limitations specified in the approved airplane or rotorcraft flight manual, markings and placards, or as otherwise prescribed by the certificating authority of the country of registry. Now, do you see the words weight and balance in here? Me neither, but what we do see is that we must comply with the operating limitations of the aircraft. Well, what does that mean? Well, the manufacturer of each aircraft has determined that if there's too much weight too far forward or there's too much weight too far back in the plane, the airplane will not be balanced properly and it will no longer be within those operating limits that we just mentioned. And it's going to be difficult to control. This is how the FAA words it in their Weight and Balance Advisory Circular 120-27. Accurately calculating the aircraft's weight and CG before flight is essential to comply with the certification limits established for the aircraft. These limits include both weight and CG limits. By the way, if you ever have questions regarding weight and balance, this advisory circular is a great place to look for the answer. Anyway, how do we know that we're complying with the operating limitations when we go fly? Well, just like you've kind of seen, inside of each pilot's operating handbook or airplane flight manual, you can find these limits. 
and as long as you stay within these limits, you'll be able to control the airplane and fly safely. But the big question is, how do we know that we're accurately calculating an aircraft's weight and CG before flight? One thing that a lot of people don't realize is that anytime you add new equipment or remove old equipment, the weight and balance information you see in the POH is no longer reliable. So anytime we add or remove equipment, the airplane needs to be reweighed. And when this happens, the guy that reweighs the aircraft creates a new weight and balance sheet so you can accurately calculate your weight and balance for that specific airplane. Not only does this sheet need to go in the maintenance records for the airplane, but a copy should also be added to the POH aboard the aircraft so anyone who flies it can make accurate calculations. Here's a look at a real weight and balance sheet from an aircraft I fly regularly. And when I make my weight and balance calculations before I go fly, these are the numbers I use, not the generic numbers in the POH. We'll still be using the aircraft CG and moment limits from the POH, but the numbers we use are going to come from the weight and balance sheet so we know for 100% fact that we're safe. Because I don't care how overweight my mom is, she's special to me. My mom's not actually overweight, I'm just making a point here. Let's do one more of these with this real weight and balance sheet and I'll show you how to shift the weight if there's a problem. Okay, so if we look on this sheet, we can see that our basic empty weight is 1,424 pounds and the center of gravity is 37.65 and our moment is 53,617 inch pounds. So let's put this over here in this little chart from the POH to make things easy on ourselves. By the way, you don't actually want to write this in your POH. It's better to actually do this on a scratch piece of paper. Unless, of course, you want to see smoke coming out your instructor's ears. Anyway, if you're trying to get this down to a gnat's whisker, it's important to note that the basic empty weight of the airplane that we saw over on the weight and balance sheet includes all the oil, hydraulic fluid, or whatever other kind of fluids it needs. But it does not include usable fuel. So when we run the calculations here, we need to scratch this out. Now, let's say that you're going to sit up front by yourself this time, and you've recently lost some weight. So now you only weigh 150 pounds and we'll just multiply this times the arm. Wait a second, there's no arm on this chart, and a lot of older POHs don't show them. You either have to use a spaghetti chart right here like I showed you earlier, or you can run their example numbers backwards to find the arm they use to make their calculations. And to do that, we still need to use the formula mom's overweight. And this time, it'll be 12,200 divided by 340, because remember, this moment is in thousands. And this gives us an arm, or a CG, of 35.88. Let's call it 35.9. Now we can multiply that times our weight to see that our moment is 5,385. Okay, here's something kind of weird. As I just mentioned, the basic empty weight does not include the fuel. But check out this weird note over on my weight and balance sheet. This plane was weighed with 36 gallons of usable fuel or full fuel tanks. At first glance, this could throw you off and make you think that the fuel is included in the basic empty weight of the aircraft. It's thrown me off before too. But take a look down here and see that the ANP that did this subtracted all the usable fuel off of these calculations. It's really important to note that it's not normal for an airplane's basic empty weight to include the fuel. And the reason for this is because the center of gravity can actually shift on some airplanes as you burn fuel. The CG doesn't really change a lot when a Cessna 172 burns fuel. So it's not really a huge deal if your weight and balance sheet on 172 was made this way. But I bring this up because I want you to be sure that you're reading these notes very carefully when you're using these weight and balance sheets. Okay, let's get back to making our calculations. So we said that our basic empty weight does not include the fuel. Let's say we have 25 gallons of usable fuel today. That means our fuel weighs 150 pounds. And for this one, I'm going to be really lazy. The A&P already looked up the arm for me today and wrote it over here on the weight and balance sheet. It looks like we have an arm of 48 inches, and that's around where most 172s are, so that passes the sniff test. So I'm going to use this arm and multiply that times 150 pounds to get a moment of 7,200 inch pounds. Let's see, Mama's been packing on the pounds lately, so now she weighs 450, and so she's definitely going to have to sit in the back now. Once again, I'll run my calculations backwards to see that she's sitting at load station 70, and that makes her moment 31,500 inch pounds. And on this trip, she's wanting to bring a 120 pound bag. So you throw it in the back here in the baggage compartment. And I'll use this spaghetti chart this time to calculate this one. And it looks like we have a moment of 11,400 inch pounds. Okay, so this gives us a total weight of 2,294 pounds and a total moment of 109,100 inch pounds. And if we look at this chart, you can see that we're below our max gross weight, but this time our center of gravity is a little aft of what it needs to be. 
Based on this chart, it looks like we need to reduce our moment by 1,000 inch-pounds. But to be safe, let's say we need to reduce it by 3,000 inch-pounds. But here's the problem. Some of these older POHs don't have a CG envelope that depicts the arm. This chart only gives us a moment envelope, so we can either do one of two things. The first is to use this spaghetti chart. I know we need to reduce the moment by 3,000 inch-pounds, so let's try something. What if I took this 120-pound bag and put it on Mama's lap? Well, let's see. First we'll find 120 on this chart, then move over to our line. And just like we mentioned before, this weight is producing 11,400 inch-pounds of force. Let's move up the rear passenger chart and see what the difference is. If I move up the chart to 120 pounds, I'm getting about 8,200 inch-pounds. So 11,400 minus 8,200 equals 3,200. And we said we wanted to reduce the moment by 3,000 inch-pounds. So this is going to work. The other method is a little bit more precise. This document is called the Type Certificate Data Sheet, or TCDS, and you should be able to find this in your aircraft's maintenance records or the FAA's website. And basically what this is, is the FAA's official list on all the limitations on this aircraft. This is especially handy on older aircraft where the POHs are kind of crappy and they don't give good, clear information. To use this document, we just need to find our exact aircraft along with the correct specifications. And below that, we can find a list of the airplane's limitations. And if you notice for the normal category, we've got two different sets of limits. And our total weight today is 2,294 pounds, so we should be using this one up here. It looks like our Ford CG limit is 38.5 inches, and our aft CG limit is 47.3 inches. So if we use our CG formula of mom's overweight, we can see that our actual center of gravity is 47.55 inches. So now we can see that our actual center of gravity is exactly 0.25 inches aft of where it needs to be. And now that we know that, we can fix it by pulling out that weight shift formula we used earlier on the seesaw. Okay, so this time we know that we need to move 0.25 inches forward. Let's call it a half inch to be safe and give ourselves a little bit of a buffer. So let's put that here in the change in CG spot. Now, how far are we moving it? Well, let's try moving it from the baggage compartment up to the back seat with Mama again. So we're moving it from load station 95 to load station 70. That's a difference of 25 inches, so let's write that in here. Our total weight is 2,294, so we'll put that in this spot. And we're trying to figure out how much weight we need to move, so let's call this X. And I can see that you're getting kind of tired, so I'll solve this one for you and it looks like we need to move at least 45.88 pounds up to the back seat with Mama. Or, once again, just make her hold that thing. She's probably going to want her 120 pounds of candy bars anyways for the flight. I'm sure she's going to get hungry at some point, and you don't want that much weight shifting on you during flight if she reaches back to get them. Hey, I really appreciate you guys letting me make fun of your mamas today. I hope you learned something. I would really appreciate you hitting the like button for me. It really helps me out. And when I get the next private pilot lesson up, I'll put that right here. If you want to learn how to use ForeFlight to do weight and balance, my friend put together a great video on that. And I'll put that one right here if you'd like to focus on weight and balance a little bit longer before you move on with your training. And as always, sit! Bro, you're not going to believe this. I just bought a free pilot training. I'm going to keep on watching.